welcome everyone once again to what church are we at? <laughs> <laughs> That ain't nothing. I tried to get some people voted into a former church I was at when I was up at Reedy Fort. Somebody wanted to join the church. I'd been there about a month, and they come down to join the church, and I got up and said, yeah, we'd like to, uh, these folks would like to join uh, Mountain View Baptist Church, and, and that, of course, that was in Stanley County and so forth like that. So don't feel too bad. <laughs> All right. But it is good to be back in the house of God tonight, and the Lord certainly has blessed us in such a wonderful way with his presence this morning and throughout the day. And we're thankful today for what all God has done. We have a thank you card here for Annie Dees. And Annie Dees says, Dear Church Family, thank you so much for the cards and the visits and the gifts, especially your prayers. I love each one of you, Annie D. Harrison. And I believe I looked back there and she was here this morning. Wasn't that right? What an encouragement when you see some of these senior saints that are able still to get out and come to church and have that great desire to come. Uh, and it's just such a blessing. She's such a sweet woman as well. But we want to continue to keep up with your bulletins. Like I said, we're right at the very uh, start of a very busy season getting into Easter and everything of that nature. And there's going to be Easter egg hunts and all kinds of activities and things of that nature. From here on out, the children are very busy doing and going places, the youth it, as well. And it's just going to escalate by the time the summer gets here, the youth and and so forth, the children are really going to be busy, and so keep up with all the things that are in the bulletins and newsletters and things of that nature, because uh, it's going to be a great blessing. We are going to be having a sunrise service this Easter, which is April the 1st. Somebody said the atheists and the Christians are able to celebrate uh, their holidays on the same day, so that's amazing that uh, it's worked out that way. But uh, we're looking forward to Easter, and we'll start our sunrise service at 8 o'clock. Then there'll be a breakfast after the sunrise service and then the Sunday school and the 11 o'clock service as well. Always an exciting time as we get to enjoy those things. Well, let's go ahead now tonight as Brother Mike comes and leads us in our opening song. Uh, and uh, we just want to worship God tonight. All right, if you want to stand with us tonight as we open up just worshiping the Lord with every day with Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and He's the one I'm living. Well, let's sing it through again one more time. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living. sweeter than the day before. Amen. Remain standing for prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, you are truly so good to us, and we're so thankful for the way that you love us and that amazing grace, dear God, that unconditional love that you have toward us. And Lord, we are just wanting to bow our heads before you and thank you and praise you and let you know that we love you. And Lord, we're thankful for the services that you've given us here this morning, and I'm sure uh, many churches experienced the same thing. And Lord, we're praying that once again tonight that you'd open up the windows of heaven and, get, and continue to pour out your blessings upon us in such a rich and wonderful way. And Lord, we certainly pray for each one that is here tonight, and we pray for those that are not able to be here, that you'd be with them and help them, Lord, in a very special way. Continue, dear God, to uh, look after this nation. We're praying, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to defeat Satan on every uh, turn. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, for all the missionaries that are out in the field. And we pray for everybody that is in the service of this nation, dear God. And we ask your blessings upon them in a very special way. For these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs> It's 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Let's really sing out tonight on the third verse. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Remain standing for our toy prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is again with thankful hearts that we come before your throne of grace tonight. Lord, thanking you for this privilege of prayer. Lord, we thank you that we're able to come apart, to have a place where we can come, Lord, and worship you in truth and in spirit. A place apart from this old sin-cursed world where we can meet with you and, Lord, knowing that you will meet with us. Yes. We ask God tonight as we've come together that your Holy Spirit would just have right away in our midst. Pray that you would just anoint the singing. God, that you would use the man of God as he stands to proclaim your word. Lord, anoint him from on high with a powerful word, Lord, that we need today. God, we ask your blessings upon this church and every outreach of the ministry, that through this place, this hospital beside the road, this place where men, women, boys, and girls can come yes. to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for the mission that you have given the church. And Lord, for all the areas that the church reaches out, and all the many souls that have been saved, and Lord, that the countless that are going to be saved. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the mighty movement of your spirit. Lord, we're praying for a revival in the church. We're praying for a spiritual awakening in our nation. God, that we could see this nation once again turn back to you. Repent, Lord, that we might see an awakening in this nation. Yes. God bless, I pray, our time together tonight. Bless the tithes and the offerings. Yes. God, use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And Lord, for all that you do, we just praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
as the last week or so as Billy Graham um, have they towed him around everywhere and um, he's led a great life and all the way his Savior led him um, all the way the Savior led my grandpa I was thinking about my grandpa and my mom this morning as Kelly was singing that song and just got overwhelmed um, because my mom loved that song and uh, Kelly sang it at her funeral and um, I could just see her raising her hands to see Papa raising his hands and, uh, Billy Graham I know he just rejoiced as soon as he got there with them and uh, they all got to meet each other so I want to sing this song for them tonight All the way my Savior leads me Who have I to ask beside How could I doubt His tender mercy Who through life has been my guide And all the way my Savior leads me Cheers each winding path I tread Gives me grace for every trial Feeds me with the living bread You Keep me from falling You carry me close to your heart And surely your goodness and mercy will follow me And all the way my Savior leads me Know the fullness of His love Know the sureness of His promise In the triumph of His blood Spirit clothing mortal Wings its fly to realms of death This my song through endless ages Jesus led me all the way Let me all the way You lead me You keep me from falling You carry me close to your heart And surely your goodness and mercy from 
Savior leads me. Lord, it's certainly the presence of the Lord is so real and so rich here this evening, just as much so as it was this morning. And, well, I want to tell God I'm thankful that he is here with us today, and he certainly is welcomed here in this service tonight. And I also want to just let God know that I want his will to be done above all things. And I want him just to be able to be praised and worshiped as he deserves. And we ought to be just really, truly, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, coming before the Lord and thanking Him every moment of every day for how good our God is to each and every one of us. If you will, please turn with me in your Bibles once again to the book of Romans. And we've been in this passage of Scripture in chapter number 3 now for quite some time. But we're seeing here how that Paul is writing this letter to the church at Rome, which has been a very successful church, and it had grown tremendously, but they really didn't have any sound doctrine for the most part, and Paul here is trying to write to them and trying to give them some foundation to stand upon concerning salvation itself. And of course, he was dealing with probably, for the most part, a lot of Jewish people that really believed that really truly because they were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were automatically going to be able to go to this wonderful place called heaven and they realized, of course, Jewish people thought that Gentile people were like dogs because of the way they worshipped and the way that they lived. And so they really didn't think that Gentiles would able to be saved or ever get to go to heaven. But Paul here is saying not only did God love the Gentiles, not only did God love the Jewish people, but God made a way for the Gentiles to be saved and thank God for that. But not only did his son die for the Gentiles, his son died for Israel. Because you're not going to heaven because Abraham was your descendant. You're not going to go to heaven because Isaac and Jacob were your forefathers. The only way that you're going to be able to go to heaven is through what Jesus Christ did on that cross at Calvary where he shed his blood, gave his life so that our sins could be paid in full. And so here... Paul is writing and telling the people at Rome, you've been summoned to a courtroom setting and we've all received a summons, every one of us here tonight, because all of us are going to stand before the judge one of these days. And here is 14 indictments that Paul has brought against mankind, not just Jewish people, not just Gentile people, but everybody. And if you're guilty of any one of these 14 indictments, then you're guilty of sin and you need a savior to save your soul. We've already looked at several of these indictments and God says here through Paul that the evidence that he is going to use is the word of God. And we've looked through the word of God and we've seen how that when God says there's none righteous, we can look through the word of God many times and we can find the reassuring words that none of us are righteous. And when we realize that really and truly we're not going to be able to stand before God and try to talk him into the fact, well, we really were all right. We really weren't that bad. We really, really are really pretty good people. Then God will turn to us and use the same evidence that Paul is presenting here in this passage when it says it is written. And God is going to say, I've already told you that there's none righteous. There's no not one. But then we might try to come up with some defense on ourselves, especially if somebody is lost. And a lost person might say, well, I'm better than the preacher up there at Altamaha Hall Baptist Church. Well, I hope that you are better than the preacher up there at Altamaha Hall Baptist Church. But God is not telling you to be more righteous than the preacher. God is telling you that you need to be as righteous as I am. And God's going to stand there and tell you that might be lost that are trying to find some excuse or some reason why... God should let you into heaven because you've been just a good person. God is going to say, I'm not going to look at your life compared to anybody else's life on earth. I'm going to look at the fact that you were not a sinless person, that you did sin from time to time and probably truthfully on many occasions, but yet you rejected the wonderful, wonderful truth that my son loved you so much 
that he was willing to be punished for everything that you ever done, and he was willing to forgive you of every sin you ever committed, and he was willing to save your precious soul, but through the lifetime that you had there on earth, you continued to refuse him and reject him, and you didn't want to have any part of him. Now I'm going to cast you out into outer darkness, and there in the lakes of fire, you're going to be forever and forever and forever. Now this is serious indictments. Here we're dealing with life and death, eternal life in heaven or eternal existence in a place called hell. So if you will, please once again stand with me as I look into the book of Romans chapter 3. And in this passage of scripture tonight in verse number 12, I'd like to share with you what the word of God says. They are all gone out of the way. Now we looked at this passage of scripture last Sunday night. And I'm here to tell you, just like I was preaching last Sunday night, that there are a lot of people who have diluted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've not only diluted the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I'm here to tell you they have polluted the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of occults out there in the world today. And there's a lot of people that are attending some churches and church services and all they're really doing is attending in an occult setting because somewhere along the line the true gospel quit being preached and upheld and they started substituting all these other things concerning works and good deeds and church membership and baptism and communion and and all these other things which cannot and never will be able to save one soul. The true gospel, the Bible tells us that if anybody comes to you and preaches anything other than what we've already preached to you, whether it be me, Paul was saying, or, or whether it be an angel out of heaven, don't you have nothing to do with them. Don't you even bid them goodbye. And so this is a very serious charge when God says that all have gone out of the way. They are all become unprofitable. And that's what we want to speak on a little bit tonight. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. What do you think Paul is uh, uh, referring to when he says our throats are like open sepulchers? And their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. I believe that we're going to find that these are charges, these accusations uh, are going to be something that we could probably, every one of us say, I am guilty. And if you're guilty of just one of these, that's all it takes. And so if we're guilty of all or one of these things, what are you going to do when you stand before God? Friends, if you're lost, you're on your own. You don't have an intercessor. You don't have somebody that's going to act in your defense, but thank God 29 years, 39 years ago, I hired myself the best lawyer in the world. I hired myself the best, I didn't hire him, I just got the best intercessor that anybody could have, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that there's only one intercessor, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when I stand before God, is going to be able to look at me, and I'm going to honestly sit there and say, I'm guilty, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and Jesus Christ is going to uh, plead before the court and say, I know that he was guilty, but I want to tell you something. I've already been punished for his sins. He believed in me and trusted in me. Now, Almighty God, welcome him into the portals of heaven. Amen. I'm glad today I've got an intercessor, but there's a lot of people that are going to stand before God one of these days who have absolutely no defense whatsoever. But the Bible goes on to say there in that passage of Scripture, of course, concerning these things that really and truly we're going to find that we are guilty of more than one, and in most cases we're going to be guilty in some way or another of every single accusation that Paul is going to bring against us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this has truly been a glorious day. And God, I am so thankful for your presence right here. I'm thankful for a holy unction, dear God, that comes from on high. I'm thankful, dear God, that there is such a thing as a fresh anointing, dear God, upon your people, upon your servants, dear God. Because, dear Heavenly Father, tonight I feel a fresh anointing upon this old boy. And God, I'm thankful for it. For God, I know, I know, dear God, that I can't do a thing without you. And I know that what needs to be done can't be done by any man. But what needs to be done can can only be accomplished through your power and through the presence of your Holy Spirit. 
And so, dear God, tonight I pray that people wouldn't even be looking at me, but they'd just have their mind focused on you. And God, just hide me behind the sacrifice that Jesus went through there on the cross. And Lord, just give me the words to say that might somehow or another, Lord, open the eyes of those that are lost, but also touch the hearts and stir the souls of those of us that are saved, dear God, and let us know what it costs for us to have salvation. And God will praise you and give you all the honor and all the glory for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. The next accusation that I want to bring to you out of verse number 12 is, and the Bible here says, they are all, they are all, they are together become unprofitable. Can I share with you something that I hope will stir up your heart tonight? I hope by way of remembrance or being able to remind us tonight of how much that God loves us and how much God has done for us. After all God has done for us, what will we have to show that we have done for him? I want us to think about that right now when we stand before God and we realize and we're going to be looking at some things tonight that literally will prove that God really has done a lot for every single one of us that have gathered here tonight. But what are we going to have to show when we stand before God that we did for him while we were yet still here on earth? Especially when we've already seen that God gives us special abilities. When God says, I gave every one of you a gift. Now some of you have been given more than one gift that can be used in the service of the Lord. But when we look at this and we realize all that God has done for us, I believe in many cases we'd have to just lower our heads and realize that we really don't have that much to show uh, uh, God that we've done for him while we've been here on earth. Now I know that we could never repay God and I know that God's not expecting us to break even on this whole scenario. We could not never repay him for salvation. There is no way in the world that we could do that. But God has invested so much in us. Don't ever forget that God has invested so much in every single one of us. Let us never forget what salvation cost us or cost God. It didn't cost us nothing, but it costed God. Do you realize that in order for us to be saved and set free from sin and have that wonderful promise and assurance that we're going to go to heaven, all the gold in the world could not have redeemed us. All the silver in the world could not have saved us. All the precious gems in the world could not have bought our salvation. What did it take for us to be saved? It took the only begotten Son of God to come to this world and to die a cruel and harsh and horrible death on the place called Calvary. And that's the only way that we could have ever been redeemed is through the blood that was shed there by his son, Jesus. Friends, and I don't never forget how much God has done for us. Don't forget what God was willing to allow his son to go through in order for us to be saved. But what are we going to be able to show God that we were able to accomplish here on earth uh, with the wonderful gifts that he gave us while we were here on earth when we stand before him? I look at this word particularly there in verse number 12. And in verse number 12, I am really concerned what does it mean to be profitable. The Bible here is clearly saying that they are together become unprofitable. Do you know what the word unprofitable there literally means? The word unprofitable there literally means spoiled. When I read that in the dictionary and I realized that what the Bible is telling us that we have just become a bunch of spoiled brats. I believe that's basically what we could say here tonight honestly. And I think with all my heart and truthfully speaking that we are spoiled people. We're so spoiled that we've gotten to the place that we really don't want to do anything for God, that we always just expect him to do everything for us. It's not so much all the time that God, we want this. It should be most of the time, God, what can I do for you today? But today that's not the prayer that's being offered up. Today, people have become so unprofitable. 
the church today has for the most part become unprofitable. Even though the population of the world is increasing, I mean in vast numbers beyond our ability to comprehend, baptisms and salvations are continually to decline. Churches are continually to close or closing their doors. When the world's population is exploding, why isn't the church out here exploding with it as far as growth and salvation is concerned? It's because for the most part, the church itself has become so spoiled that we're just like little children that we're not going to get forth any effort. It's all me. It's all me. It's all me. When I look and I study about some of the different things in the Bible that God says for us, and he warns us concerning some of these things, I look at Matthew chapter number 5. And in Matthew chapter number 5, and beginning there with verse number 13, let's look at what the Bible here is saying here about unprofitable servants of God. How does a church become so unprofitable? How does an individual become so unprofitable? Look at this passage of scripture and verse number 13. You are the salt of the earth. Now, do you know what salt does? Salt preserves. Salt protects. But I'm here to tell you right now that the salt that God uh, associates us with, God warns us that one day it might not be worth nothing. Now, I can remember a time when the church was worth something. I can remember a time when, my goodness, on a Wednesday night, they wouldn't be having ball games. I can remember a time that on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoons, they wouldn't be having our young people having to go to baseball games and basketball games and things of that nature because the church back then had some salt. But the church today has lost its favor. The church today has become so spoiled that we're more interested in patting and tickling people's ears than we are in proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. And the Lord here is saying that there's all a lot of people now that have become really unprofitable. Where are the people being saved at? Where are the people getting on fire for God at? Where are the people that are surrendering to go to the darkest places of the world to be missionaries at? The church and individuals today, as the Bible here is bringing this indictment against us, is saying that they're becoming unprofitable. Look at the rest of verse number 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot a man. Do you think that the politicians in Washington today are concerned about the Christian movement? Do you think that they consider what the church might have to say concerning the liberal ideas of men marrying men, women marrying women, changing this sex business, and all these other horrible situations like abortion and other things that are going to be coming along? Do you honestly think that they have any concern as to what the church says? And you realize that it would be hard to find a lot of people in America alone as I'm speaking right now that wouldn't say I belong to some church or another. Go out and visit. And they'll say, well, yeah, I belong to this church. Sometimes I've done that and I've asked them, well, which church? <laughs> then they'll say, oh, hey, uh, well, it's a... Uh, 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 I, I, yeah, I belong. I, I belong there. My mom and daddy went there and, and so forth and so on. I'm here to tell you that most churches today have become good for nothing. Most churches today are being trotted on. They've been cast out in the floor and politicians and atheists and Muslims and everybody else it seems like it's just trodden and stomping all over Christianity today. Where was it at back in years ago they would have never gotten by with the things that they're getting by with today? They would have never gotten by on television persecuting Christians like they're getting by with mocking and ridiculing Christians today. But you want to know why they're able to do that? It's because 
the salt has lost its savor and the salt has become good for nothing and the salt has been cast in the floor and them movie stars and all these actors and, and other athletes and things of that nature are just swoking all over Christianity. Now there was a time they wouldn't have gotten by with that. But they're certainly getting them by with it today, aren't they? Boy, I'm here to tell you right now, look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse number 24 and verse number 25. Then he which hath received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strolled. For I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. You know the story of this if you've been in church very much at all. You know how that this is a symbol that God uses to try to bring across a point. That he's got several servants there and he gives one so many talents. He gives another so many talents. And he just gives this one servant one talent. He goes away. And then the master comes back. The one that he had given so many talents to, that fella had multiplied his talents. He had just been able not only to do what God had enabled him to do with the talent that he gave him, whether it was money or whatever it might be, he continued to grow and multiply. And then the other fella or person that he gave some more talents to, not as much as the first person, but that person there had taken what God had given him and used it greatly and mightily to the point that it had multiplied. But then he comes to this person right here who is absolutely unprofitable. He gave this person a talent, but this person, instead of using the talent that God gave them, he went and buried it. And what did God do with it? The master, when he found out that this man or person, whoever it might have been, who had been given a special gift, a talent to be used, he hid it away and didn't use it at all. He's afraid he's going to lose it. What are you saving yourself for? Well, when I retire, you know how many times I've heard that? When I retire, I'm going to really get involved. Well, by the time you retire, you're going to lose that talent that God gave you because he ain't going to let it rot in the ground. The church needs that talent. The gift that he gives us all is needed in this day in which we live. Every one of you, every one of us are valuable to God. God's given every one of us an ability a special gift to be used in his service. And it's a gift that is needed in every church, every community. The reason why our communities and our nations are in the shape that they are in is because too many people have got too many jars buried in the backyard. It's time for you that are absolutely not profitable at all to get out there in your backyard and dig up them old jars and get that talent that God's given you and put it to good use. Amen? Amen? Amen, because if you don't, what will God do with it? God will take it away from you. And then you're just going to sit on a, on a log like a knot. You'll be bored to death. You'll be miserable in church because you're not participating at all. You won't be touched by God. You're not going to have the wonderful joy of serving God and God just falling all over you. You'll not have the joy of God just filling your cup up till it's overrunning because you didn't want to serve God. You hid it because you're afraid you're going to lose it. Guess what? If you don't use it, you're going to lose it for sure. Guess what God's going to do with it? God's going to give it to somebody who will use it. There's a lot of people in here that are carrying a very heavy load, doing many different tasks, because there's some people that are hidden their talents, and they're not using it to serve the Lord. And when you stand before God, what are you going to be able to show that you've done for Him after all, after all, he has done for you. 
Are you a profitable servant? Or are you an unprofitable servant? There's a lot of churches today that might as well have Ichabod written across their door lentils. Do you know what Ichabod means, don't you? The spirit has, the glory has departed. I was sitting here a while ago just rejoicing. Rejoicing how the presence of God was here this morning in such a whoa way. Amen. Anybody had any spiritual insight at all could tell that it was about to explode here this morning. Amen. And I was sitting there listening to the choir sing tonight and Sherry got up here and started singing. Woo! I felt it again. Boy, how blessed we are to be able to come to a place where God shows up on such a regular basis. But there's a lot of places where Ichabod might as well be written across the door lentils because the Holy Spirit of God is nowhere near it. But I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of people that really have truly become unprofitable and they're not able really, or not, they're just not willing to serve the Lord at all. There's a lot of people that are just spoiled rotten. I know what that is. I was never spoiled rotten. Oh, oh no, I was never spoiled rotten. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm spoiling my grandchildren rotten. I really am. I didn't really, oh, I tried to spoil my children a little bit. But I mean, I'm really spoiling my grandchildren. I mean, they rotten. I know they are. And I tell you right now, as much as I've tried to do for them, all they got to do is let me know what else they want. And uh, they're going to get it. One, some way, how or another. I'm telling you right now, I love them guys. And, and I tell you, I spoil them right now. I, I really do. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that have been saved that are spoiled rotten and are not really willing to do anything for God, especially, and I'm going to say this plainly, especially the Christians of America. Look at how blessed we are here in America. You don't know how blessed we are. What every American Christian should try to undertake at some point in their life is a mission trip somewhere to some far off land. And I promise you that when you come back to America, you'll thank God for the many blessings and all the things he's bestowed upon us here in America. Because we got plenty to eat here in America. And I mean, I don't have to go out and check no traps to see if I'm going to be able to eat dinner today. I mean, I don't really have to go out and do any fishing today to see if I'm going to be able to feed my family today. I mean, honestly, before God, we've got it made here in America. We've got more than we need to eat. <laughs> oh, just, just humor me a little bit. We're rich in America. You say, I wish I was rich. <laughs> I think that there's been someone somewhere that said, if you got five or ten dollars in your pocket, you're richer than really a large percentage of the people in the world. So we're here in America, we got plenty to eat. We're rich here in America, we have money. There's probably not anybody here in the auditorium here tonight that if they didn't, if they wanted to, that they could stop by and pick up a Coca-Cola on the way home, and they really don't need the Coca-Cola. It's not necessarily of any of, uh, 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 vitamins in it that would really help us or that we absolutely have to have. But I'm here to tell you that if we wanted to stop and get a candy bar or a Klondike bar, or if we wanted to stop, we got the money to do it. We're spoiled rotten. Look at what all God's done for us. But what are we doing for God? Are we profitable or are we unprofitable? When we stand before God, how are you going to answer that? What are you doing for the Lord? Yes, we're spoiled rotten, especially us that are Americans, and I'm thankful that I am an American. But I'm here to tell you right now, God has really blessed us in so many wonderful ways. We can go to some of the finest hospitals in the world. And I mean, we don't have to travel all that far of a distance. You got Duke Hospital, you got Chapel Hill Hospital, Cone Hospital. What's this other hospital over here? Oh, for Huffman Mill Road, what they call that? Yeah, yeah, regional hospital. I mean, we got some good hospitals uh, pretty close by that you can go to. 
and there's some wonderful doctors. The best in the world. God's given us the best of the best. Are you profitable? Or are you an unprofitable servant of God? But many still, after we've received all these many blessings from God, many do not serve God in any way. And they're going to have absolutely nothing to show God that they did for him with what God gave them when they stand before him. If you're going to stand before God empty-handed, are you really? Friends, I'm here to tell you there's some people they won't come to church unless the temperature's just right. If it's too cold, you might as well forget it. In the church, I'm not talking about the weather outside. I'm talking about if it's too cold in the church. Even though we give you a blanket, we'll, you, we'll try to help you. We'll try to get you. Uh, and there, if it's too hot, if it's too hot, they won't come. I'll give you a hand fan. I'll give you whatever it takes. I'll get some deacon to stand around you and fan you if they have to. <laughs> but we're so spoiled here in America. We really are. We don't go to church like we should go to church. We're not faithful to God like we ought to be faithful to God. And people are watching our lives. And then we go over there and try to invite them to come to church with us. And they mock us and ridicule us just like Lot's family mocked and ridiculed him when he went to his own family, his own daughters, his own son-in-laws, and he tried to tell them that judgment was about to fall on this city. They mocked him because they had watched him over the years. And he was what? Unprofitable. Unprofitable. I'll tell you right now, if you go on a mission trip, I'll tell you right now, it'll change your views of how good God's blessed you. But still, uh, there's a lot of people today who are not willing to be a living sacrifice for God, and a lot of Americans don't want to be a living sacrifice from God. If it costs us something, we don't want no part of it. Americans today, a lot of Americans today, don't believe that they should serve the Lord or need to serve the Lord. A lot of Americans today won't tithe after God has blessed them with the ability to work and given them a job that pays them and and they still have plenty of money maybe to go do these little things or that or another. And yet still they'll rob God before, before they'll do without anything else. What are you going to do when you stand before God and God says, man, you have robbed me for years and years and years. What are you going to say? Have you been a profitable servant of God or are you an unprofitable servant of God? Go to the mission field. Cindy and I had the wonderful opportunity of going to the Philippines. It was a wonderful experience that I will never forget, and I'll cherish it as long as I live and probably throughout eternity as well. Because when I and she went to the Philippines, when she and I went to the Philippines, we were able to see how the hungry people there needed the gospel, and when they heard the gospel, they received Jesus Christ. We would go throughout villages made of bamboo, huts, and thatched roofs. I'm telling you, it's just like you see uh, on some of the old nature shows and things like that. I mean, living out in the midst of the jungle, and you go out there and you start telling them about Jesus, and they would want to know Jesus, and they'd accept Jesus Christ. You could lead just countless numbers of people every day to Jesus Christ throughout the Philippines. And when they said, or you invited them to come to church that next Sunday, and they said, I will come, we will be there. We might be 20 miles away. We might have been further than that away from some of the, for some of the places that we went to. And I mean, it was some places that was only a path leading through a jungle-like area on back up into a hillside or whatever it might be. You want to know what happened that next Sunday morning? Those people came. Some of them had to start out hours, hours early, and the only way that they could get there is walk. A lot of them were barefooted, and they would walk. And they'd come to church to proclaim Jesus Christ. And when we got to that church, <clears throat> the first service out there at Brother uh, Dix's church out there, <clears throat> he had been meeting under an old canvas tent. <laughs> it was a small, like circus tent, but it wasn't one of the big giant ones. It was a small one, but it uh, had patches on its roof. They had had to sew patches on its roof. It had been up for 10 years, maybe. I mean, it was rotten. The tent was rotten. It leaked. <laughs> Didn't have no sides on it. <clears throat> you got underneath the tent, it had absolutely dirt floors. It had planks that were laid down upon other pieces of wood that they used for benches. No cushions whatsoever. There was no air conditioning. They wasn't even fans in that church. 
And me and Brother Dix and Cindy and his family, we were sitting out there getting ready for the Sunday morning service to come. And I'm telling you, just, it just overwhelmed me to see people just coming through the, the fields, coming through uh, rice paddies. They'd come through these little paths. I'd say, who in the world's going to make it out here because it wasn't in the middle of town? But they would come, and they had these like little unusual type buses. Really, they would. The inside of the buses would be absolutely filled to where there wasn't even any standing room inside the buses, but also outside the buses on the back bumper. And you know the back bumpers wasn't very big. Every space on the back of that bus on them bumpers would be people standing, and they'd be holding to an open window around and holding to each other. And on the roof, the roofs would be packed to capacity with people coming in. So what was it, eight, seven hundred, nine hundred people, something like that, showed up that first Sunday morning meeting under that old tent on that dirt floor, no heat, no air conditioning, the roof had patches all in it and things of that nature. Boy, I'm telling you right now, those people there, they showed me something and how blessed we were here in America, but yet how much we take for granted. Boy, I'm telling you, that was something to behold when we got that opportunity to go there. They didn't have the type of medical treatments that we have here. Matter of fact, when they went to the hospital there, if you couldn't pay up front, you didn't get nothing. And even if you paid up front just to get in the hospital, it might mean that you just got a cardboard mat to lay on. If you was fortunate enough to have enough money to get a bed to lay on, it doesn't mean that you was going to get the medication that the doctor prescribed to you because there again, you had to pay for the medication before you got it. And I'm not talking about a lot of fancy equipment. I'm talking about a nail drove into the wall to hold an IV uh, bag and things of that nature. And I'm not talking about that long ago. But I'm talking about these people loving the Lord and they would come where it was rain. They would come no matter what the situation was. But friends here today, I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of people today who have their names on churches' rolls, but they're not attending. They're unprofitable. Many are unprofitable. Many are not doing anything for God. And we got all the transportation. We got all the vehicles that we need. And we can easily uh, go to a good church. And it's getting harder and harder to find. I really believe a good Bible-believing church. But if we had to drive a few miles just to make sure we was going to a gospel-believing, Bible-preaching church, I think it was absolutely worth every, every uh, moment that we spend in a vehicle driving there. And we got cars, we have shoes on our feet. Matter of fact, we probably got more shoes than we need. We got more clothes than we can wear. We got air conditioning, we got heat. The only thing I think we of Americans are lacking is storage space. <laughs> we're not going to be very profitable for God until we're reaching people for Jesus. Somebody said you can't take nothing with you. That's not so. Some people say, well, you're coming in this world without nothing, you're going to leave without nothing. That's not, no, no, oh no. What do you think it was like when Billy Graham stepped through that gate the other Wednesday? I think it was he died on Wednesday, maybe. The 11th, was it? Anyway, he died. What do you think it was like millions, millions of people that had been won to Jesus through the Crusades? that God allowed him to preach and millions of people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What do you think it was like when he walked through those gates and people come up to him and said, it was because of the way God allowed you to preach at that one particular meeting that I'm able to be here today? What are you going to have to show God for all that God has done for you when you stand before him? Are you a profitable servant or are you an unprofitable servant? Will you be walking down the streets of gold one day and somebody comes up to you and says, you might not recognize me now, but I went to your Bible school class when I was young and you told me about Jesus and I asked Jesus to save me in that Bible school class. And because of that, I've been able to come here today. See, you might not be able to take all your riches and gold and silver, but there's just possibly some people that are going to be there in heaven because you were willing to give of your time and your effort.
to share Jesus Christ with somebody, where it was in vacation Bible school, where it might be in a Sunday school classroom, where it might be in a church setting, or where you went out and knocked on somebody's door, or where you went over to some of your family and friends' home, or whether you just told somebody at work about Jesus Christ. There hopefully is going to be people in heaven that you've had some type of influence or at least put forth a little bit of effort to tell them about Jesus Christ, and they're going to be able to be there in heaven because of that. Are you going to be profitable? Or are you going to be unprofitable? Jesus says that when we stand before God, one of the indictments that's going to be brought up is the fact that many, they are unprofitable. What are you doing right now for God? Do you not realize what all God's done for you? Do you not realize what it took for God to redeem us from our sins. And do you not realize that one of these days we're going to stand before Jesus and the books are going to be open? Or are you going to stand before Jesus empty handed with nothing to show? You can't never repay him and I'm not talking about that not one bit. But I'm talking about are you using the abilities, the talents, the gift that God had given you If you're sitting here right now and maybe God's spoken to your heart and says you've never been saved. You see, God knows it. I don't. <laughs> I don't know it. You may have the person beside you fooled. You may have the person behind you fooled. You may even have me fooled. But I'm telling you, you ain't got God fooled. And God through his Holy Spirit right now could be telling some people here tonight You've never been saved. You've never been saved. But you can be tonight. <clears throat> this is the hour. I've chosen this moment just for you. You may not have this opportunity again because I may not come by your way like I am now. If you're not saved here tonight, don't you pass by an opportunity of God speaking to your heart because God might not speak to your heart no more. And you'll die in your sins as the Bible speaks about. You'll want to come to heaven, but Jesus says you're not coming to where I am. You're going to die in your sins. You're going to die in your sins. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, I mean right now, even before we ask anybody else to stand or whatever it is, I just want to ask you right now, right there, right where you are, just bow your head right there and just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Your word proves that I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, I need to be saved. And Lord, I know one thing for sure is I can't save myself. Lord, would you save my soul? Lord, would you save my soul? Lord, would you come into my life right now? Would you come into my heart, my life? I want you now to take control of me, Lord. I want you to use me. I want to be used. I want to serve you. You've done so much for me. You've forgiven me of my sins. You've saved my soul. I want to tell other people what you've done. I'm going to ask you to do something here tonight. <clears throat> That if you've just prayed that prayer, why don't you just stand up right now where you are. And why don't you come down here to the front and just meet with me right here at the front. The Bible says, it truly does say this, it really says this, that if you really are saved, you're not going to be ashamed. The Bible really says that you're not going to be ashamed if you really are saved. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Let's just, let's just defeat Satan here tonight once and for all on your behalf. If you prayed that prayer of salvation and you really believed it by faith, why don't you come? But there might be others here tonight that have looked at their life and realized, well, we really have not been that profitable. I'm guilty. I've not been very profitable. I've not done really hardly anything for God. I've just taken it for granted. I'm spoiled. 
I go to God and I ask Him for this, I ask Him for that, and I want this, I want that. But I really, really am not serving God in any way. I'm not really doing anything for Him. Then why don't you come tonight and say, Lord, I'm sorry. God, you did so much for me, and you gave me abilities to do certain things, and I'm not using that ability. In some cases, he may have already taken it from you. And you might want to come tonight and say, Lord, I didn't use it like I should. But Lord, if you'll give me one more chance, just try me. Lord, just give me one, one more gift. Lord, let me just do something. Let me do something. I'm going to serve you, Lord. I want to serve you somehow. No, I don't care if it's painting. I don't care if it's picking up trash off the floor. I don't care what it might be, Lord. Just let me do one more thing for you. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Are you profitable? Or are you an unprofitable servant? The Word will prove it. It's written. What are you doing for Jesus? Let's all stand to our feet. Our Heavenly Father, if we bow before you sincerely as we know how, we are thankful for what you've done for us. We've been reminded tonight about Calvary. We're looking forward to Easter here coming up in a few weeks. And God, we know, we know what Jesus went through and what he was willing to do so that we could be saved. But God, I got to admit, and I know that sometimes I've just been so spoiled. You've done so much for me, dear God, and I really have taken so much for granted. And there's been so many times I could have done more for you and I should have done it. But I just shook it off, dear God, and I just went on my own way and had and did my own thing. But God, tonight I'm asking you, along with hopefully some others here tonight, God, don't take your gift away from me. God, allow me to use it in some way, somehow or another that God, it will be profitable to you, not to me, but profitable to you. Some soul might get saved. Somebody's heart might be changed. God, I pray in the name of Jesus.